Good afternoon. Today is July 12th, 2013. My name is Tommy Sisna. I'm conducting an oral history interview at the American Legion Convention in Springfield, Illinois. And my interviewee is? Reginald F. McAfee. And um, where do you hail from, Reginald? I, um, I come from um, Post 838 Maywood, Illinois. I live in Broadview, Illinois. Okay, so uh, northern part of Illinois. Outside Chicago area. Okay, good enough. Um, I'm from Mattoon, so I'm way downstate. <laughs> and that's why, that's why I asked. Yes, I'm out of Chicago. Yes. Um, what, um, <coughs> what wars or conflicts did you serve in? Um, I supported the Beirut conflict in Lebanon. Uh, it began in uh, 1983, and for me, it began all began in October of 83. Okay. When um, uh, when did you uh, join? What year did you join? The I joined uh, October 1982. I did my basic training at Fort Bliss, Texas, and uh, my AIT training at the Academy of Health Science at Fort Sam Houston. Well, now, um, uh, you say in 82, uh, now you're from uh, the Chicago area. Did um, uh, you just walk down to the recruiter's office, or did one of them come to the high school and ask you, or... Um, I think how it all started is I actually stopped at a recruiter's office in the mall, talked to a recruiter, and he talked to me a little bit, you know, more about things. And then I decided that I want I would join. And uh, the recruiter asked that uh, I'll probably have a wait of six months before I would actually begin my time of service. And so six months later, he called. I went down to AP Station in Chicago and uh, signed up and came out of there with the uh, MOS of 92 Bravo uh, B210, uh, 92 B2, B10, I'm sorry, which is a medical laboratory specialist. I've uh, been offered things like uh, cook and <laughs> take driver, and of course I wasn't willing to accept that after being you know, in school at the Illinois Institute of Technology for two and a half years studying metals and materials engineering. So I kind of created a ruckus in the office of the APs, which actually drew out the sergeant major and he wanted to know what all the trouble was. And so I told him, I said, I just told this guy I've been to Illinois Institute of Technology for two and a half years studying metals, materials engineering, and he offered me to be a cook. So the sergeant major said, find this man a good job, and I mean a good job. And he came up with medical laboratory specialists and definitely I'm involved. I uh, have a big interest in science, so I'm like, great, I'll take it. Now, uh, you say that uh, you were in college at the time then. Well, I had to leave college. Then. The money... <laughs> At the time, um, the president, uh, Ronald Reagan, had uh, taken away uh, additional money for secondary education, so I was kind of left in the, out in the open. And I wanted to continue on with some type of career that would just, you know, keep me moving forward in life. So, so the, the, the military, you looked at as a, uh, uh, an option to uh, a further education? and As an opportunity, definitely as an opportunity. Okay. Um, was, um, how old were you when you... Uh, when I first applied, I was uh, 19. Um, after the six-month wait, I was 21. I went in, so. Okay. Uh, so um, were you uh, living on a college dorm at the time? Or, I mean, were you living at... Uh, when I left school, uh, yes, I was. I was living in college. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, you were used to being on your own. It wasn't like you left your parents' house. and uh, So a transition into uh, being away from home is was not really going to be an issue for you. No. Okay. That's true. Um, were you single or married? Oh, single. Single. Lots of girlfriends, though, right? Oh, yeah, I had a couple of girlfriends, yeah. Well, somebody to write home to, right? Yes. Did, um, um, when you joined up, uh, you went down to the recruiter station all by yourself? No buddies go with you? Or? No, nobody's all by myself. Okay. You just have to start. As a matter of fact, a lot of my buddies thought that I might be kind of crazy for doing such a thing. Um, uh, you know, for a person to decide to enlist into the military is um, is definitely a, a choice, and it's a serious choice. So as most people are not at that age are not ready to make those type choices. No, they're not. And that and and that's what uh, I was kind of getting to is, is why uh, you saw something, uh, an opportunity. Uh, the recruiter had either planted something uh, with you as far as an opportunity because you know you had to know that there was going to be some type of rigorous training. Uh, along with this, uh, the regimentation of of, of it, uh, and 
you know, at uh, 82, uh, yeah, Beirut, Lebanon, I mean, yeah, you'd seen, I'm sure you'd seen the pictures of Korea and, and you'd seen um, the newscasts of Vietnam and, and uh, Grenada. Oh, yes, I grew, Panama. I grew up watching Vietnam uh, film clips, you know, in the 60s and uh, especially uh, C.G. Kaysan. <laughs> I definitely remember uh, right. those. Uh, so did, did any of that uh, come into play when... Well, to be honest with you, I was never really looking forward to the combat situation, although it's, sometimes it can be kind of a, a glorifying event to, to a young man to, to participate in such, such activity. However, uh, growing up in the inner city in the, in the uh, 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 low-income projects, and then we moved out, but even moving out, we're only like three blocks away from where I grew up in a place called uh, Ida B. Wells. A lot of firefights were already going on, so. <laughs> you, you, you grew up tough anyway. Yeah. Uh, how many in your family? I have an older brother and three younger sisters. And uh, any of them in the military? No. Was your dad? No. Okay, so this is first first generation to. to My mother was very upset when she found out I joined up. <laughs> <laughs> but you were already out of the house, but I'm sure that she. Mom well, have a way of. school. Because school it came to an end, and I spent the summer back at home. Oh, and, right. And the uh, first couple of months, um, I'm still at home. <laughs> and then it's time to go in the service. Well, but uh, you're smart enough to to figure that out. I mean, it wasn't like it was a last desperation type of thing. You were you were intelligent enough to say, "I've been to school, and I can further education with the military." True. I, like I said, I saw it definitely as an opportunity to uh, keep, you know, lifting myself up. Since I wasn't able to go back to school, my uh, oldest sister, uh, she was in school at SIU. Uh, and um, <clears throat> actually what happened, the government sent my family a letter saying that they could no longer plan on both of us to be in college at the same time. So since my sister was going to school down at SIU, I told her, you take the funds, I'll try to get a job up here and make things work. And as a result, uh, working and dealing with an engineering program is not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> did um, um, What branch of the service did you pick? Uh, United States Army. Army. Uh, why? Any special? Actually, I wanted to, uh, I wanted wings. I wanted, I wanted to fly helicopters and uh, specifically medevac helicopters. No, oh, there you go. Okay. Um, and, well, and the Army has that. They had, they had that. Uh, my ASVAB score was, uh, I think it was total was 106. Okay. And I was told I was just underneath the cutoff, you know, the, the cutoff point to be accepted to go to flight school. So when they, once they told me that, then the recruiter would offer me, you know, a job as a cook. And he says, I don't want to be a cook. He says, you want to be a tank driver? Can I drive it in Chicago? And see, that's what uh, I was looking at, an MOS that I could actually get involved with and bring back home and work at. Yeah, you're, you're, you're looking for useful, usable training. Uh, you're looking at the, at the end game after you come out. Yes, sir. Well, uh, see, that's, uh, you were smart going in. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did it feel when uh, the, the recruiter, you know, pushed that paperwork across the table and you put uh, Reginald McAfee on the dotted line? It was scary. It was scary. Because at that point, um, I didn't know exactly what I was getting into. I don't think anyone really does. Um, and you're by yourself. And you're by yourself. So you're going to have to deal with it by yourself. You're going to have to grow up. <laughs> and, and then you took the paperwork at home and showed your mom. No, I never showed her the paperwork. I just told her I signed up for the Army and I was going to be leaving in a few days. I, I was wondering how, how long did it take for after you signed up, but uh, did uh, you get notified by letter or telephone call? Or I signed when I signed up, as I recall, when I signed up, they told me I was going to have to wait six months, and then after the six months, I would go in the AP station, we would pick out an MOS, and then I would be off to service, you know, to begin my basic training. So for over six months, I had known I had signed up. But I just wasn't telling my mom. <laughs> oh, so and you still had your job. Back, back home. Well, I didn't have a job at the time. I was just out of school, you know, doing I did a little contract work, you know, painting yeah. houses, things like that, you know, yard work. Biden time. Biden time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, so then you got notified. And I was notified. Yes. At, by, uh, by, by the recruiter to come down to AP Station. Oh, and he called the house and said, hey, come on down. Yes. Okay. And um, that's when I told my mom. <laughs> now, did he have uh, uh, your uh, uh, where you were going to be sent? All that paperwork, all that was waiting on you when you got down there yes. to the recruiter's office. Right. Signed the square in. And oh, so that's okay. That's right there, right there, the recruiter. But I had to sign first to say that I was going to join, and then I had to wait for six months. And I thought at that point, I thought that I was already in, but that's really not the case. It's, you're not really in until you swear it. And then you raised your right hand and you said, I will give my life for the country. For the country. God, I thank you so much, Reginald, that uh, um, I'm quite proud that you did that. Uh, uh, you're a blessed man. Um, it, it helped me to, to grow up a free man myself. So, you know, I, I do thank you for, for raising your right hand. And, and, you know, you're here with us. So yeah. you, you didn't have to give your life. Right. But uh, I do I do really appreciate that. Um, where was your boot? Where'd, where'd you where'd you go for your basic? I took basic training at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, Air Defense Artillery. Now, you said artillery. Yes, Air Defense Artillery. Oh. Air Defense Artillery. Air um, Air. Now, I thought it was the medical lab. That was just basic training. Oh, that? okay. So, um, uh, did they um, bus you? Did they put you on a bus and? Actually, we flew down there. Really? Civilian flight? Yes. Okay. Um, so they got you. Took us here's, to, here's your paperwork, and here's your plane ticket. Uh, you fly out O'Hare? Yes. Okay. They took us down to O'Hare on a bus. <laughs> a group, oh, a so large you, group of us got on a bus, went to O'Hare. Met at the recruiter store. You met someplace, and everybody piled on. And So it's it's other guys that uh, have they've signed their name up. Um, 20. You one of the older guys? Yeah, I was one of the older guys. Oh, I got there. everybody, most of, most of the guys were what, 18, 17, or 18, 19 years old. Yeah. So I kind of felt like an old guy, you know, older guy. You know, this is this guy was just fresh out of high school and things like that. So uh, you know, every, everything was it was all hunky dory. You you pile on the bus and and everybody's okay and uh, a mixed group of of people, a bunch of kids. Uh, so, uh, how long did it take you to, to I mean, you, you get on the plane, you're still a bunch of kids, and was the, now was the plane pretty full of uh, uh, other... Yeah, it was, it was about, I would say about 50 of us, I think, that uh, flew down. I don't, I don't know exactly how the military, how the Army did that, because some of us went in different directions, but mm -hmm. we were still like about 50 strong when we got on the plane, so I guess they had decided that on this day... You know, recruiting offices around the Chicagoland area would pile us in together, and we all were going, you know, separate ways out of O'Hare for those that didn't need to really travel unless you were going like Great Lakes or something like that. Now, um, did they, uh, did you land at Fort Bliss or did you land to the local? Did we land? Um, I don't I know. I think local airport. It was a civilian airport, and then we were bused over to okay. Fort Bliss. So everybody, everybody piling back onto a bus now, and you got all your. Uh, gear or your clothes. Yeah, your your, civilian clothes, yeah. Your civilian clothes. And now is this a, uh, uh, military bus or is it just like a Greyhound? No, this bus was interesting. This was not a bus. It was a cattle truck. Yeah. I've heard that before. <laughs> it, it, it didn't matter, uh, race, creed, nothing. You got on the cattle truck. You got on the cattle truck. <laughs> now when, uh, and how'd that look? I mean. That looked extremely strange to me. Um, and it smelled like a cattle truck. So <laughs> we kind of thought that uh, some of you can just see, you know, the, the the thinking that was going on with, you know, individuals like, okay, what did I get myself into here now? I mean, I, I'm riding a cattle truck, mm -hmm. and uh, just what's going to happen next when they put the uniform on? I mean, I'm riding a cattle truck now. <laughs> so um, um, you got on this bus, and you're thinking what you got yourself into. When you got to the, um, now I don't know whether Fort Bliss has front gates or, I mean, you, you kind of know, I've only been to a, a couple of the installations. Uh, I know Fort Lejeune, you know, the archways and check-in places and then you drive forever to get to anything. It's just this big wooded area. Okay. So Fort Bliss, you're, you're driving in. 
Um, it's like desert area around it, but on the back side of the post is um, Juarez. You can see the, the, the town of Juarez. Okay. But there's a lot of open, like, desert field around surrounding the post. When when did the yelling start? When we got off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got a big smile there. Um, they um, Did they climb on the bus? When it come to a stop, was there somebody climb on the bus and let you know that you're in the Army now? Well, you want to hear it the way it happened? Or? Sure. Well, when the bus stopped on the post, uh, Drill sergeant jumped on the bus. Are you fucking mad? Get the fuck off my bus. And everybody just really looked at each other. I said, get the fuck off my bus now. So everybody got off the bus. But, you know, we're not properly trained, so we're still taking our time. So we all got off the bus with our bag. Get back on the fucking bus. (laughs) We we did this two or three times. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah. And your gear. With our gear, right, before we actually realized what he wanted. He wanted, you know, hustle up, get the lid out. And when I say you jump, and we finally figured it out because we got tired of getting off and on the bus, you know. So. You, do you remember his name? Not at all. Okay. Um, so you're in line. Um, to really lined you up outside the bus. Yes. Um, okay. Well, what time of day? Uh, we got there uh, early afternoon. Hot. Hot, yes. And uh, for the most part, a lot of us were just hungry. We just wondering when we are going to eat when we were going to have lunch. And um, when we finally got off the bus and got that together, and, uh, everybody was identified. They put us in the billets, in the barracks. And we just sat around in the barracks. They left us alone until it was time to go to dinner. And that's when more uh, aggression with the drill sergeant started again. All right, get the fuck out the barracks. So we all get out the barracks. Line up. So line up. He says, okay, I'm going to teach you guys how to march because i got to march over the child hall. So we had to practice a little uh, drill and ceremony there for, I don't know, about 10, 15 minutes before we got that together. And he marched us over to the child hall. But I do remember on the way back what happened that day. Um, might have been the second or third day, not the beginning at all. We had one, uh, this, our reception drill sergeant, if you will. Because he had to stick with us for our first week. We didn't actually start basic training. We still were waiting for more guys to come in and form, uh, I think it was a battalion more or less. And uh, so he was marching us back from child and he was singing this song. Uh, turns out this guy was an uh, ex Marine who became Army. And he had us singing this song, Napalm Sticks the Kids. And we're looking at each other like, good God am I, <laughs> you know. Oh, wow. So we're singing this song, Napalm Sticks the Kids. And all of a sudden, the post commander shows up, pulls up. I told you I want to hear that fucking song on my post again. You seen that damn song? Your ass is out of here. So we were like, okay. So about after being in that kind of form, because then we started to go to, we had to go to, uh, what do you call it? Um, when you pick up your uniform and things like quartermaster. Oh, okay, yeah. So we went to quartermaster and, you know, marched over there to quartermaster and picked up all this gear. None of us have been, um, be- well, prior to me going to service, knowing that I had a six-month wait, I started, you know, running a couple of miles a day, you know, every morning. Mm-hmm. But found out that still wasn't good enough. <laughs> oh, wow. And you pick up all this gear, and now you got to march it back to the barracks. <laughs> and it's heavy. It's cutting in on you. You know, you got it all packed in a duffel bag. And some of it, you know, is you're trying to wear or just carry out, you know, it's, uh, was there, um, is this when the um, inoculations started in, when you got there, did any shots? Oh, or? yes, yes. We, 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 yeah, a whole nine yards, whole series of shots. And, uh, we yeah. got some shots at APs as well uh, before we left. Okay. But uh, when we got down to the post, we got more shots. And I guess those shots were just send us overseas and where they might need to send us to. So. How, about the, how about the haircuts? Were the end of the boys come down there with long hair? Uh, not that I can remember, but we all got bald heads, you know, well, crew cuts, you know, real close up. And uh, that was a, that was a, that was, that was the first day after child. Did they, uh, did they march you in and ask you how you wanted it or where you wanted it? Oh, yeah, they played that game with us. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they played that game with us. What do you, how much, uh, how would you like it? Well, you know, you know, you can make it, but leave me a lot on the top, you know. And everybody just comes out with a jacked up haircut. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I, I've heard it, it's uh, something close to, to sheep shears, 
they they said do you want do you want the three and uh, it's uh, one swipe two swipe three swipe get out of the chair yeah it was, well yeah it was pretty much like that i mean it's you know the sergeant you're next you know and you know they played the game was because you know most of us are standing around you know it was like about i don't know 10 chairs and then you pile in the room but then you got a line coming out the door as well and so, you know, the first set of guys, how you want your hair cut? You know, well, after the first set of guys, everybody knew you're getting a ball head, whatever, you know. <laughs> and and the, thing, the thing about it was is that, like you say, one side, two swipes, it, you know, you have a little high ridge over here, low ridge over here, you know, this is going to be a jacked up haircut. Just get used to it. Everybody come out scratching their new bald head. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my. Um, so, um, uh, you guys were hungry, you know, when you, you said when you got there. Uh, how was the, the first chow that you had? Actually, I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. It's good meals. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the food remained pretty good. Pretty good. At the Fort Bliss, it was, it was very good. Um, the only thing I didn't like was uh, we called it shit on the shingle. We get the toasted bread with some kind of gravy, and it, to me, it was like mystery meat because you really weren't sure what it was, but you th- thought it was beef wood, it was probably ch- chip beef, whatever they call it. Never had it before, but. It just looked of, nasty, you know. There's, there's a lot of armadillo down there too, so. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's something I found out later too. The Army of PG, anything. Oh, really? Incredible. Yeah, and um, buffalo burgers, uh, <laughs> rabbit. Uh, now uh, your uh, your per- first week, uh, you're getting your shots, you're getting your hair cut, you're getting your getting your gear, um, and they're teaching how to march. Uh, you get through the first week. Uh, have you settled into a routine? I mean, you're you're an intelligent guy, so you're no, really. First week, yeah, we did PT in the morning, but you know, it took about two or three days before we went to the quartermaster because we just didn't go right away. Oh, so um, but um, after we, you know, we got you know clothing, we would do a little exercise, not a lot, but we thought that this is, this is basic training, this is a piece of cake. But that wasn't the case because we haven't been assigned to our basic training units yet. So when that happened, um, I went to uh, Second Battalion uh, Bravo Company, yeah, and um, it was on game on now. Really? Yeah. Okay. And and this was how many weeks that you'd been? Uh, we only waited one week before we actually started basic training. It was about like the third day of being down there. We went to uh, quartermaster and do our equipment. So it was right after the weekend, we marched right on over to our basic training units. And there's a whole new different kind of class of drill sergeants going on over there. <laughs> Did do you remember any of the ones that you left for that first week or that first couple of weeks? The only the drill sergeant name that I do remember was yeah, at the time was a staff sergeant, was staff sergeant Millichon. And um, to to us, he was like one of the better. He's a tough guy, but he was one of the he was someone you could talk to. Uh, the senior drill uh, instructor, I can't remember his name. Uh, he was. Uh, well, I remember seeing him though, can't you? Uh, pardon? pardon? You, you you got a, a picture in your head. Of what oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, he, his thing was um, uh, he was a heavy drinker. There was no doubt about that. He was short, wiry. You guys didn't have any access to liquor, did you? No, no, they did. We didn't. Well, that ain't quite fair, is it? Well, for me, I really didn't, didn't care. I don't think. Well, yeah, most of the kids, so they, you know, we really didn't care for liquor at the time. Um, but this, the senior drill instructor, he's a very tough guy. Um, he call you a dirt ball in a minute. He call you things you never heard. And um, well, the first time he called this guy a dirt ball. We just fell out laughing, company size. And, oh, you think that shit's funny? I'll give you something to fucking laugh at. Get on the ground. <laughs> and he stressed us out so bad <laughs> that we knew not to ever laugh at anything he says because he was totally serious and he had the authority to just make life miserable. So we, we just left that man alone. <laughs> now, um, you've got a, a group of, of guys, a group of buddies by now. I mean, you're, I'm sure you're getting to know. Several, several people. Yeah, my squad, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Um, how big was your squad? Um, squad was about uh, 12, 15 members. Okay. And was that part of a platoon? Yes. Okay. Uh, was the platoon housed together? Um, yes. Okay. And you're on like one level? Yeah, it was just one level. So they had um, 
you know, 15 guys against the wall, 15 guys on the other side. Then they had the laundry, shower area, you know, toilets and all that in the middle. And then on the other side would be the same thing, 15 guys on one side. Yeah. Toilets in the middle. I mean, we're talking closed door toilets, not just mm -hmm. right there in the middle of the room. No, wide open. What? Funny that you bring that up. Yes, there was just no doors, no stalls. It just, you had to, um, you know, I had problems shitting my first two, three days down because <laughs> I wasn't used to everybody just sitting around. Doing Good stuff. God. Right, but after two or three days, you're going to let it go or you're going to be sick. So <laughs> you're going to get used to it. And then, you know, once, once the trainer really got on, I mean, we just pop up in the morning and just, you know, sit down and pop up. It's good. It's shower and shave. Let's go. Uh, let's, let's get the routine going. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everything's regimented then, huh? Yeah, at that point. <laughs> Everything. Down to the bottom. Individuality. Here it comes. All the, all the, yeah. All, all, everything's regimented. My God almighty. Uh, now, you, know, you kind of smiled. You said that uh, when the uh, the basic training really started, uh, uh, your, your second week, um, and your platinary squad buddies met up with, uh, uh, I guess, the entire battalion then. Right. Um, so a new set of drill instructors. So we, they broke us down to company level, which is about 100, 100, 100, 110 guys, you know. Uh, you still got um, uh, remember any of your squad buddies? Okay. One. His name was Ali. Ali. He's Indian guy. He was uh, he was saying once basic training really got underway. He said, "Come on, Mike, let's go airborne when we finish this." And I'm like, "Look, I'm supposed to go to County of Health Science. I'm not thinking about jumping out of a perfectly good airplane. I mean, that doesn't excite me." <laughs> <laughs> so it was um, um, I remember Ali because. Uh, you know, like I said, I started with a lot of kids, and there was one guy who was in his 20s. He was like about 27, 28. He was the oldest guy. We used to call him Pop, you know, in, in, in basic training. But um, one of the reasons why me and Ali became friends is because we, we both had been to college before we came into service. So we had a lot to talk about, a lot to share. I mean, just dealing with, you know, kids who don't really know anything. Right now. now, did you have access to uh, uh, communication? Did you write home? But uh, I wasn't that kind of individual that did write home. I, I did write um, to write home. I did write uh, a couple of friends of mine um, before I went into service and um, before I even went to Illinois Institute of Technology. I used to, um, when I was in high school, I used to be a, a, a messenger for a law firm. I did a lot of things other than just work in the mail room or run messages. I would actually go to the courthouse and research documents for lawyers, whether it, uh, it would have been uh, the civil courthouse or the federal courthouse. So I would do both things like that. Um, and so I was writing one lawyer because um, when I worked for this place, uh, what's his name? Uh, Trevor Kaiser Ruggles McGee and Hastings. Um, uh, Bill Snyder was his name, William Snyder. Um, we used to play chess in his office, you know, and I did this. He said, Reggie, are you busy? I said, no. He said, I'm going to the game in. I'm like, sure. And it got to the point that, because he would, he would play, I would play with a um, um, guy by the name of Robert Gutshaw, who was the, at the time, um, was the commissioner of U.S. Patents. So, you know, just okay. go back and forth. But um, Bill said, yeah, write me. And I, I wrote him. I, I wrote him. I was just telling him things were going on. And, then I had to cut the letter short or whatever, you know, and then you write me back. I don't want to hear the rest of that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you were still interested in mail call when mail call come around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, no access to telephones. We had telephones on on, on the quad on the parade ground. Um, they were definitely away from the barracks, and you had to have permission to use the telephone. You, know, you got oh, called using the telephone. Oh yeah. You got caught using a telephone without permission. You know, that's just something you want to deal with. You're going to end up in the oil room in front of the commander or the, or the XO. And um, I never had that problem. So. <laughs> well, that, that's good. That's good. Uh, when did the uh, uh, the proverbial bed folding quarter test come in? Had to make your bunks to where the the quarter. That was actually in the second week of being in basic training because. Okay. Right. They first, the first thing they do is um, they teach you, you, you drew all this gear back. So you're in, you know, say the reception barracks with all this gear. So the first thing they do is teach you how to hang up your clothes and put your clothes away, how to fold your clothes, how to make your bed. Yeah, they did that too. 
but uh, and basically, uh, when you got to your unit, it was a lot stricter in insofar as um, things being out of place or out of order. You're going to pay a price for it. You know? In other words, they're going to physically stress you out. <laughs> well, now you're you're in uh, uh, you're uh, in the barracks. You're with 100 guys, right? Um, and you each got your own individual place and stuff. And um, what if uh, uh, if one guy's not not as as tidy as the the rest of the guys? Um, yeah, they they'll stress you out by um, uh, well, platoon size, right? They'll stress the whole platoon out over one guy because this stuff is not in order. So finally, you figure out that uh, whoever the squad leader is, check everybody. And it, it, you didn't have to be the squad leader to for other people to recognize that you you know you might be a leader or a little better at something. Going, Man, let me see what you got here. Did you shine your boots? Let me see. You know. Kind of oh, so like you're, you're the the buddy system is already in full effect because we don't like being stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. You, you've said that several times, stressed out. So I, I would I'll go along with it. Um, so it's a it's a bonding process. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, forgive me for asking, but was there any uh, problem? Uh, yes. You know, like uh, you've got you got uh, an Indian, uh, you got Polish descent, uh, you've got. Uh, we uh, had one guy. I remember his name, Loveland. Loveland came to basically train an overweight, and they put him on a special diet. But Loveland had also another problem. He would wait to be. Yeah, and uh, you wake up in the morning, you smell this stuff, because what he does, he wakes up. And w one day, he one day, one well, one night, in the middle of the night, he wakes up you know, after waiting in the bed and took his sheets and just threw them in the dryer. Didn't wash them. Oh, my God. Had the whole barracks reeking. And, uh, well, finally, we had to address that, that situation, too. We started helping him out. You know, and said, uh, you know, that guy, gosh, you can just hear the guy down there. And did it again, you know. So I get up, say, give me sheets, and somebody throw sheets in the washing machine. Somebody else would be helping them put on new sheets, you know. And you know, you go get in the shower, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, see, and I, I had uh, had heard that that was a, um, a general discharge uh, if they caught a, a bedwetting. It was a. I, I didn't know that at the time, but uh, they gave him a break the first time around. Oh, did they? Yeah. I mean, so we weren't, you know, after he didn't. Well, maybe it was the second time around because we had complained about the you know sheets and stuff being thrown in the dryer. So we we made sure that uh, we just tried to take care of him. But he, I, they didn't do that to him because when we were out in the desert and uh, Bill White training, he did it again. He did to us. Poor guy. Yeah. So he did, he did make it. I mean, but he did graduate. Yes, he did. Okay. Okay. Um, now, um, uh, when did uh, uh, any weapons training during oh, yeah. the basic? Uh, when, what week did that start? Oh, fourth or fifth week. You didn't even touch a weapon until about the fourth or fifth week. Now, the, this whole time, I mean, they're getting you up early in the morning. You know, lights flip on, and I'm sure you've got to jump out of, the, out of the sack. and Five, seven miles a day running. <laughs> they, 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 um, they exercise as calisthenics, 50 minutes. We run for about 50 minutes, about seven miles. <sighs> run for 50 minutes is a long way. That's a long time to be running. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, and uh, Cal, and I mean, were you, uh, you had classes. You were you yes. were learning about the, um, I would say, the, the insignias and then what everything. Right, means. right. And like, how yeah. to salute, how to report, uh, general orders, uh, you know, like first, second, third, fourth, fifth general orders. Uh, you had to know those things. Um, <clears throat> how to tie the lace your boots. <laughs> you know? Really? Yeah. But, um, I mean, um, they took us from, you know, step one, you know, all the way to, to the end. And like I said, about the fourth or fifth week, that's when they started introducing weapons to us. And uh, the first, of course, was the M16. And uh, after we trained with the M16, uh, um, we went to uh, the spirit of the bayonet, <laughs> bayonet training. And then uh, it was about the... What the because there's only two months of training, so it's about the, the what I would say the six week. We uh, did grenades, M60 firing, rocket launching, firing. <clears throat> I fired all those weapons. Um, I scored a sharpshooter with the M16. I just couldn't hit the 200 meter target. 
Ten meters a long way down. Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> didn't think to use a you know, parabolic type, you know, aim up a little higher and let it fall in. You know, we never thought about that at the time. I actually stood up in a foxhole and took a, a like a Marine Corps stance fire visit, and the commander walked right up behind me. The fuck are you doing, Matt? I said, I'm trying to hit the target, sir. He said, Who the fuck taught you how to shoot like that? No one, sir. Get your ass back now. <laughs> 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 like that. I scored an expert with the grenade. <clears throat> Once I did that, they gave me the rocket launcher. We hit the target with that. And they checked me out on the 60. Uh, I was decent with that. I was, you know, banging the target with that. Um, you know, basic training, it, it went along fine. Uh, we did that. We had a little fun too because uh, they promised us a party. You know, drill sergeants are kind of fun. <clears throat> you guys got to donate money for your for your graduation party. So everybody's putting in money. Now you figure 100, you know, 110, 100, you know, 110, 120 guys is putting in money for a party. We expect that party, right? It's a lot of money. <clears throat> Came time for, for uh, we had that graduation. You know, okay, where's the party? Ain't even party. What do you mean? Well, can we get our money back? No, that was donated to the company fund. Right. So three of us that night, we actually went over the fence, <laughs> went oh. to the liquor store, oh. got got wasted, came back over the fence. I mean, we were falling off the fence and all that. I mean, we got wasted. And we ended up on the side where the telephones were. On the other side of the parade ground, a drill sergeant comes out the uh, orderly room. What the fuck are you doing over there? Oh, caught you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see, but we graduated now. Uh, so and so had me a phone call. Get your ass back over here. Right away, Joe Sergeant. So we came back. He never knew we was wasted. <laughs> so we go in the rain, we got back in the barracks, and washed up, and just, you know, jumped in bed, tried to, you know, hide more or less. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we got away with that. Well, at least you had, you had, you had a little outing. Yeah. Um, some um, some good times, some good buddies. So um, uh, basic was really not a uh, a strenuous time. I mean, you didn't you weren't. It was doing well. I mean, you're doing the running and the, you know the exercise. And I mean, it's, you know, you're being stressed. You know, you're being you're strengthening your body, and they always taking you a little more than they did yesterday, so to say, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but you know, as time went by, you know, <clears throat> we we're gonna do mountain climbers, you know. 25 sets of mountain climbers, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, two, you know. And after a while, you know, when you first start, you're only doing like five sets because that's all you're going to be able to do, you know, and go to jumping jacks and do something different. But uh, by the time of graduation, oh, we, we, we were tough. We were hungry. We didn't do anything. That was no problem. <laughs> you know? uh, well, I was going to say, uh, now uh, you're out training. Uh, did you miss your family during basic? No. Okay. You were concentrating on what you were... Well, yeah, what's in front of me. Well, I quickly realized we had a guy on the grenade range. He um, <clears throat> he tossed this grenade just outside the foxhole. Okay. <laughs> and the, the shrapnel, because we're standing behind, a, you know, like a bulletproof glass, if you will, you know, looking at you know, people test out. And that when that grenade went off, that shrapnel hit that glass so hard, you, you know, you just knew it was real. And if you weren't... Since we got involved with weapons, if you weren't really seriously paying attention, you can seriously get hurt. So killed, yeah, more or less, or killed, right? So was there um, anybody got hurt on the firing range or the grenade range, other than what you just talked about? Um, no, not in, not in my class. Okay. Class before me, I heard someone that got oh, that the hurt. Told, yeah, told told the story. Actually, he got uh, he got shot, <laughs> but the bullet only grazed him. So he rode home and told his parents he had been shot. And, and no, I don't get the Purple Heart for that. No, you don't. <laughs> You're not a graduate. Uh, no. Did um, uh, everybody that started with you uh, make it? No, I think they got rid of like, like three guys. We had one guy that refused to salute the commander. It was a racial thing. So he was a white guy. Commander was black. And um, they, they finally, um, they, they just got rid of him. Um, now, uh, you started in, started in 82. Uh, so what? This is still 1982. Still 1982, right? Uh, yeah. And they had racial like this. I mean, there wasn't any segregation, was there? No, it wasn't any segregation on the post. No. Okay. But um, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, yeah racism was still in, in in effect. But see, I didn't see it first. I did. I did not see it like you know, like command structure or, or sergeants. I mean, I'm in basic training. The only thing I know, I'm going to get stressed out here, and then trying to build up my body. 
and nobody really cares, you know, about that. The only thing you want to happen is the day to end. I think the, the worst, <laughs> the worst duty. One way to put it. Right. The worst duty I experienced in basic training was um, KP. They woke us up. We normally get up uh, every day at uh, 3.30 a.m. Well, if you're doing KP, you're up at 2 a.m. Oh my. Your day, right? And when you leave KP, your clothes and your boots are totally saturated with water and food. I mean, you just, if you walk, you're squeaking, you know, it's, but it's just water and food, you know, and you just, you want to change clothes, you're icky, you know, you don't want to go to the bathroom if you got to go to the bathroom. You just want it to end. <laughs> oh my God. That's, you know, that's, that's, pots and pans and the slop and the slop barrels, you know, and every day. Pick Pharma comes and get the slop barrel, so you're out there helping unload, dump that stuff, and you know you got just it's just a mess, it really. Is. So it was uh, uh, KP was uh, I mean that's actual punishment. Well, everybody had to do it, and, right? Well, it's, it's a punishment if you know if if you need to be you know um, discipline discipline, right? They'll have you do KP for a week. Oh, ouch! Yeah, you know, two or three days or something more, you know. But everyone had to take a turn at doing KP. Okay, well, and that's good. Right. That's morale building, right? Right. <laughs> You're not doing something someone else hasn't done, so. Um, um, any other special buddies when you were in boot camp? I can't think of this guy's name because we used to sing songs. He was he lived around Fort Hood. Oh. And, uh, matter of fact, he actually ended up going back to Fort Hood, too. He was 55 for all of our children. So they sent him there for basic training. Um, but I can't remember his name. Well, we used to get together and just sing songs, you know, like, you know, do our stuff, you know, kind of almost, you know. Well, very good, very good. Uh, now, during your uh, uh, basic training, uh, any other, um, uh, how do I put it, uh, shenanigans in the uh, in the barracks? No. Oh, you know, you, you mentioned something when we were talking about, um, you know, how to, like, keep your bed neat and everything. I, I kind of giggled because I thought about something. We had an inspection one time by the command. Okay, I mean, you get inspected by uh, <clears throat> subordinate drill sergeant or the senior drill sergeant or the XO might pull an inspection, but when the commander pulls one, you better have your stuff in order. So let me tell you how this went. They, they, <laughs> I was in second platoon. They inspect the first platoon first, so we never knew what was going on over there. It was our barracks, the orderly rooms, and then you know, first platoon's there. So he got to me, and everything else was fine except I was collecting rocks. They had some very nice, pretty rocks, you know. And being in middle you know, I can appreciate that, especially, you know, you cut a material in half, you're looking at it, you know, from the inside, put it under a microscope, you know, whatever. Pre fresh, uh, pressure and time. Right. And he opened up my drawer and he says, God damn, senior drill sign, another fucking rock collector. Get on your face, man. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was just like that. So I'm in the front lean and rest position, so they inspected all 60 guys. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So then later, I had to report to the room, what's up with the rocks? Well, they're pretty. They look nice. I like nice rocks. You know, I like to collect them, you know. So I was studying metals and materials engineering. I got an appreciation for it. He says, look, you're a fucking soldier now. Fuck them up. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Uh, no, okay, we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna go there anymore. Um, so it had to be. Um, uh, you're getting fit. I mean, you're getting trained. Um, you're. Uh, you can probably tell that the, uh, things are coming to a uh, a point. Yeah, they're coming to an end. Um, uh, graduation. What was uh, what was graduation like? A long hot day. Very long. We had to, um, I'm trying to think, what did we have on? Uh, we had on a uh, dress green uniform. And the whole entire um, basic training battalions, all the battalions were graduating that day. So we're all standing out here. On, first, you got a march to parade ground, which is maybe almost seemed like a couple of miles away from the barracks um, for the post parade grounds. And then, um, um, you line up in formation, you get in formation, you stand there at parade rest for like two hours. So everybody gets there and lines up. Now everybody's there and lined up. Now we're waiting for all the commanders to get into the stand. And it's just hot. <laughs> you know, it's so hot. You can actually see the Kiwi roll off your shoes, you know. It's, 
Yeah, it's just melt. It's just standing there melting. You know? Wow. They had uh, medics on standby, guys passing out. You know. And oh, they were dropping out. They were dropping out and put them in a the cracker box to try to you know get some fluid in them and things like that. And for the most part, those that fell out never returned back to the parade ground. Right? Now, mm -hmm. now you said a, a cracker box. What? Oh, that's a, an ambulance. This is the <laughs> box we call it the cracker <laughs> box. Okay. Uh, there, there's all kinds of military terminology that one I hadn't heard. Uh, is what that was. I'll, um, I'll remember that one for, for quite a while. Um, so that had to be a proud day. I mean, it was yes, hot. It was. it was hot, hot, hot. Now, you graduated basic. That's your, you're out of boot camp, you, but you still haven't got any stripes yet. I got a mosquito wing on graduation. Oh, did you? Okay. Okay. So you. And an E2. An E2. No, you're right. No, I was still a book private. You're right. I didn't okay. get the E2 until I graduated. Uh, did um uh is any of your family? Because I, uh -oh. I did arrive at uh, San Antonio with a strike. Okay. That's uh, next is is uh your, your duty station. And, and, uh, advancing the different training. Hang on just a second. When this runs out, what do we do? Just a second. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure we were, uh, it's an hour limit on this. So we were getting kind of close and I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to lose it. <clears throat> okay. Um, ready for your next 40 minutes, right? Yeah, I guess. Well, really? We've, we've already gone. 40 minutes? Yeah. Yeah, 45 actually. Oh, okay. And it's recording. Okay. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, your family, did your family make it down to pre graduation? No. Okay. No. Too far away. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you, but I you mean, had, we, were, we didn't have a lot of money anyway. So. Well, uh, were you sending any back home? I mean, you had, you had, yeah, I was sending some money back home. You know, I'd send a little money back home. I, at the time, I think I was making like 530 something dollars a month as private. So. Yeah. But I mean, I was sending, you know, a few dollars home. Like that. Being a good son. Yes. Very good. Um, <clears throat> so you graduated. Did you know uh, where your first, uh, were you sent to a duty station or were you sent for advanced training? I was sent for advanced training to uh, uh, for, uh, the Academy of Health Science at Fort Bliss, Texas. Ah, big place. I've heard, uh, yes. I've heard that come across on many interviews about, uh, about Fort Bliss. But um, weren't you there for um, air defense? No. It just happens that the Fort Bliss is air defense artillery. They train air defense artillery, but they also are a big basic training. Oh, okay. Unit. Okay, okay. So, um, as I was saying, uh, my uh, my MOS was uh, 92B10, which was a medical laboratory specialist, so I had to attend the academy and went to school there. How did, um, how long did your training last? At um, Fort, uh, Fort Bliss for your... Fort Bliss. It was yeah. four months. Four months. Four months in um, now, not they're, they're not yelling at you now. No. Um, they're still kind of still regimented, though. True, because you have to attend class and you got to be on time and can't be whacked out or drunk or anything like that. This is medical school, so if you mess up here, you probably end up being infantry or something like that. <laughs> <clears throat> Let me tell you, um, Fort Bliss was a. It was a great, it was a fun experience. One day, let's see how does it go. Okay, let me start here. You know, I was late for formation a couple of times in the morning. Every morning you get up and you, you form up and then you go off to class. They don't march, you can just go off to class. But you gotta make that formation. So I was late a couple of times. So the XO says, uh, I'm gonna give you, I'm, a, I'm Article 15, so I'm gonna give you some extra duty here. I said, okay, sir. I said, what you got for me? He says, well, I've been looking over your 201 file. See, you've been to engineering school. I got a job for you. I says, okay, sir, what is it? So he says, come with me. So we went outside, went out to the parking lot. And San Antonio is just as hot as uh, Fort Bliss. And he says, I want you to redesign the whole parking lot to maximize the amount of cars we can get in here. And I'm like, okay, sir. I says, I'm going to need a few things. He says, what do you need? I says, well, I'm going to need uh, paper, clipboard, pencil, and a tape measure. 
He says, take my friend. I said, yes. He says, okay, come with me. So we went back to the office. He said, here's your paper, here's a clipboard, here's a pencil, and here's a ruler. Oh, my. And then give me a ruler. So I'm standing there out there in this parking lot, and I'm looking at it. I'm looking at it. And I'm just assessing the situation. So I'm looking at it, and I'm saying to myself, I no, I'm not going to measure this whole damn thing with a ruler. So I quickly kind of formulated like a, you know, like an algebra formula, if you will, mm -hmm. and just did a couple of sections. And from that couple of sections, I was able to keep going with drawings. But I did have to get out there with that ruler and measure, you know, how far to the next section. Yeah, uh, like a manual algo algorithm. So I had to do this. He had me on extra duty for him doing this. So he comes out there. He says, McAfee, you're done. You can go now. I said, sir, I'm not finished. He says, you can go. I said, I'm not finished. He says, you're done. I, it's a little probably you're done. I says, sir, I want to finish this. I just need a couple more days. Just a couple more days and I have it finished. He says, all right, so, you know, suit yourself. So I went on and finished and I turned my drawings into him. So he turned the drawings into a contractor. The contractor came along and he says, oh, this is great. I mean, the XO was telling me the story. He says, because he came back to me and says, McAfee, what you did was great. You saved the Army a whole lot of money. You saved the Army a lot of money. He said, the contractor came in. He saw your drawings. And he says, I don't have to do any blueprints. He says, it's right here. And I didn't get any credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you got, now this is, this is extra duty on top of, of your school that you were, you were correct. training. So you had to do this after hours or after your, right, right correct. After your training. On my free time. But since I, you see, you know, I should have got, I felt I should have got some credit for it because I went above call of duty. I mean, you know, well, I did my time. Yeah. Well, you know, a, a plaque on it would have been nice or, or, or something. Pay raise would have been even better. Yeah, yeah, that would have been nice. Though. But, uh, just some uh, type of accommodation when it was written or something. You know? Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, being the property of government. Right. You're, but you know, that's something I never really thought about or really concentrated. When I was in service about accommodations or medals, I never really thought about those things. But I did, you know, I knew that once I turned those drawings in, that, you know, you get top quality stuff here, you can wait a couple of days. You know? um, because I really, you know, prided myself on, you know, the education that I did receive in school at IIT. I uh, just took an opportunity to put that to use. Um, I let, um, so, at, you know, after that happened, you know, about a week or two after that happened, um, we're in the gym, we're practicing to play intramural basketball. And I get bridged. I go up for a rebound against the center, and I got up over him, and I'm powering down on him. So he bends over, he bridges me, and I flip over his back, and I see the ground coming up fast, so I scream, ah, bam, to separate the bones in my right wrist. Oh. So I end up over at the hospital. They put, uh, they put a, they put a, um, yeah, they put a brace on. They put a brace on. And so at the time at the academy, we're going through titrations, you know, you know, you know, pipe, uh, pipettes, and you know, you know, we'll drop add this amount of chemical with this and all this and stuff like that. So no problem. I, my left hand's still good. It's no no big deal. So <clears throat> I get the brace, and I'm, I had it for a couple of days. So then one day you can't play basketball, right? So one day I'm out there with you know. Uh, a couple of what I would call like dirty guys from you know in our, in our unit, and we're playing with a skateboard. They're, these guys out of California, and big old skateboard, right? So we're playing with the skateboard. So what we're doing, we're pushing each other towards the steps, and the steps are concrete with steel edges. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we, and then you, what you do is you know you go as fast as you can, you go up the incline just before you hit the steps, you let the skateboard go out from under you. So I did that. The guy's pushing me. Well, he stepped on my left thumb and broke it. So. Same day, that same guy, he broke his, he broke his right ankle. So we both at the hospital together with cast. <laughs> Come back to you. So now I got a cast on my left hand and a brace on my right hand and uh, get called into, on the carpet again. Uh, Matthew, what are you going to do here? We, uh, we can rotate you. I said, no, I can finish. Oh, no, you can stay. You know, we'll just rotate you through the next class. I said, no, no I'll finish with my class. And you know, this is, Okay, so you know I'm doing doing I'm finishing and you know, I finished up, so I, I leave out of there. Um, they took the cast off, the thumb was still broken. They promised me surgery, orthopedic surgery. Never got that when I got to Germany. Then went to Germany on profile. 
got to Germany, get off the plane, first thing they had me do, they put me in charge of pain the billets. Oh, really? Yeah, just right outside of, uh, what is this, uh, Rheinstein Air Base, I want to say. Now, billets, the housing? Yeah, yeah, you know, barracks, but this is like an apartment now, you know, this place, you know, it's not like a regular um, barracks and billets. You know. So, I mean, you um, you finished your training, uh, your medical lab specialist, right. um, and uh, you got ordered. Uh, how long did the class last? Four months, you said? Yes, four months. I graduated top 10% of my class. Oh, wow. And um, they asked me where would I like to be stationed. I told them, uh, I want to go to Hawaii. So they sent me to Germany. <laughs> so after, you know, spending a, a few days there in the, I forgot the name of it. The, what they call that when you get to Germany, you, you stay in this holding place before they decide which way you're going to go. So they decided that, that I was going to Nuremberg. And we said, well, well, they asked me again, where would you like to go? Munich. So they sent me to Nuremberg. <laughs> so it's I, the game they play, right? Right, it's the game they play. So uh, I met with the uh, command sergeant major of 7th Medical Command. He says, uh, McAfee, where would you like to be stationed? I said, well, I already told him I wanted to go to Munich. They sent me here to Nuremberg. He says, well, I want to see you to grab. Grappenbeer, a place called Grappenbeer. I said, what's Grappenbeer? He said, it's a training post. He said, but we really need you down here. I says, okay, Sergeant Major. Uh, no problem here. So I had to spend uh, what, one, two weeks up there in Nuremberg before they actually sent me down to Grappenbeer. So I got down to Grappenbeer, and they had two females running the laboratory down there. One was an E4, and the other one was an E3. And after being there for two days, I'm I'm talking to Top, and I'm like, hey, Top, these, these girls, they don't know what they're doing. They're not keeping any records. They got things going in the uh, bacteriology, bacteriology um, uh, the name for it. It's like a, a hot oven, if you will, but it's not really hot. It just keeps things warm, yeah. so bacteria can't fester and grow. And uh, I said, they got stuff in there, and it's not even labeled. <laughs> so he says, yeah, I know. He says, that's why you're here. But now, now, what uh, what rank are you by now? I'm an E2. Still an E2. E2. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I says, well, 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 if you got me here, uh, uh, top, I mean, what do you expect me to do? Because they outrank me. I mean, they're both giving me orders every day, all day long. You know. Right. He says, yeah, I know. He says, just be patient. We're gonna take care of it. So about a week later, they moved both of them out to a town called Bill Sector, run the sick call over there, and they put me in charge of the lab as an E2. A lot of people couldn't believe that, but I was I was fine with it. I was totally fine with us. And uh, um, so the first sergeant came down after they left. The first sergeant commander came down, flight sergeant, uh, Dr. Schoonover, Major Schoonover. said, um, so what are you going to do? I said, well, sir, since I can't make hells and tails out of most of this stuff, I'm going to get rid of it and just start all over again. Now, any patients that, that you've seen already that supposed to have uh, specimens in here, just send them back to me. Then. We're just redoing it. I'm just reading the whole so thing. you were an uh, analyst and right. Okay. I'll tell you a great story. The story got me uh, an opportunity to run the parasitology lab in the in the, um, in the um, hospital for a month. For a whole month, I was in charge of shit. Literally speaking, I had to take it out the freezer, let it thaw out. Oh no! You know, I would take out like four, well, no, about five to seven at a time. You know. Take it out first thing in the morning, and by you can't you can't rush it because you don't want to change anything that might be actually going in here. So you can't heat it up or anything. You just got the it property out. Right. So this poop, when when it's, when it's properly thawed out, you got a good smell going on here. So you know every day I come in there and I, I would do this, and uh, I had a little, I developed a little regimen so I just wouldn't have to be smelling this all day long. But what what occurred at uh, 540 because I was assigned to uh, 547 General Dispensary in Grafton here. Which, uh, which is pretty much a mass unit. So, uh, but it's a full mass unit, complementary with dental and everything else. Um, he says, Reggie, I got, and the commander always called me by my first name. He says, Reggie, I got this kid whose mom says he's got worms, but she won't bring me a worm. I says, okay. I, he says, I don't know what to do. I can't treat the kid because I don't know what to treat him with. I says, well, he says, he says, I'm going to send, him, send, send her over to you, and you can take a look at the kid, but you do whatever you think is necessary to find out what's wrong with this kid. I said, okay, sir. So, she, kid's mom comes over. I never saw the kid. 
kid of mine has come over and she says, well, he's, he's got worms. I says, well, how do you know he's got worms? She says, I see the worms. I said, well, why don't you bring us one? She said, I'm not touching that. I says, okay, ma'am, okay. I says, um, I'll tell you what you do. Let's do this. Um, I'm going to set you up with some stuff. But what I want you to do today is make sure that your son has a full day of play. Okay? Because I want whatever is in his digestive tract to work his way down. Okay, but I want them also tired. We're going to do this right. So, so I want you to work them really hard, let them play really hard, and then give, when he gets, comes in the house uh, or whatever he's doing, then, you know, give him a good big meal, feed him good, and give him a hot bath. <laughs> and put him to sleep. Yeah. So that's what she did. I said, now I want you to take the scotch tape, fold it in half, place it in his anus very gently, and just let him sleep. Now, before he wakes up, you need to go get that scotch tape and peel it off very gently, and then just lay it nice and smooth on my glass slide and bring me the slide. She did that. So when I'm, she brought me the slide, I looked at the slide. Well, I found an egg, you know, a worm egg. It was hookworm. So uh, I called the major up. I said, uh, sir, um, I know what the kid's problem is. He says, what, what is it? I said, he's got hookworm. He says, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. He says, no, are you sure? I said, sir, I got it right here on the microscope. You come see for yourself. He says, okay, I'll be right over. So he came on over. He looked in the scope and he said, okay, Reggie, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you what I was looking at. I said, okay, hold on, sir. You got a reference book. I said, there it is. He looked at it. I'll be there. That's what got me up to the dress and you laugh for a month. Well, now, um, uh, how'd you learn that procedure with the tape? Was that in part of your training? No. That, I came up on my own. Really? You just yeah. thought? But she didn't want to touch it. I figured she'd touch it. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that being a mom, yeah. You're yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, uh, that's a, a, a pretty pretty intelligent, pretty smart procedure there. Reginald was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I thought, they, they thought so, too. You know, I'll tell you something that uh, uh, happened during that time when I was at, um, up there at the hospital there for a month. They, they went TDY status. And uh, uh, when I got to Grappin' Beer, they put me in a four-man room by myself. And then it turned out that my roommate was a homeboy. We grew up like a half a mile from each other. He was a medic, but he had went TDY, too. But he wasn't at the hospital. So one day I was up at the hospital, and they had sent him over to the hospital. So we decided we were going to have a little R&R &R and go out to the wall in Nuremberg. So we go out there. This is out October of uh, uh, 83. And we go out to the wall, and you know, we have a good time. So we're leaving now. We're coming back to, to the hospital. We're getting ready to come back or check out some clubs, something like that. So we're walking the street, and uh, all of a sudden, we see blue light going on an MPG. Two guys in an MPG uh, pulls up on us, and it, the guy goes, uh, and that is civilian clothes, but they, they have weapons, you know, and they got a M16, M60 mounted on the Jeep. And he goes, you guys are, you guys are, um, he says, you guys are in the Army, right? And I looked at I looked at my friend, uh, 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 his name is Sean Grayson. I looked at Sean and I says, uh, what do you think, Sean? Two black guys in Germany with crew cousins? What do you say? <laughs> and, and the MP says, look, Private, I ain't got time to fuck around with you. He says, we are on alert. This is not a drill. Report to your duty station ASAP. And I'll repeat, this is not a drill. So and he said, and, and I said, well, can you, can you drive us to the hospital? Because he says, no, I got to alert everybody I can find. And you do the same along the way. So he says, uh, so we just take our money. And then every corner we turned, there were more soldiers added to the line. This thing got big. When we got to the hospital, you knew it was real. They had, uh, okay. I'm just trying to keep it. How was the, how was the uh, visit to the wall? I mean, that's still standing. You know, uh, kids nowadays don't don't know. No, anything. nobody. Yeah. No, no. That was, that was good. It was the, the visit to the wall. It was, it was great. It was, it was well. I'm not going to say great. I mean, it's not like the the thing you what you really want is a girlfriend. It looks like something on the wall. <laughs> you really want your own girlfriend. Yeah. But uh, you know, you deal with what you got to deal with. Well, you got you got a wall. You got the space in between. You got the serpentine wire. I mean, that's kind of formidable. Yeah, but like I said, I mean, you know, you go, you know, what was interesting about the wall, they stand up and it's a castle. And it's got glass, you know, glass cutouts for windows, big glass cutouts. They stand up and, you know, glass. 
pick whoever you like. But like I said before, you just like to have one of them as your personal own girlfriend. You're not seeing everybody else. <laughs> but uh, let, let me get back to the story. So mm-hmm. we get to the front gate of the hospital. The hospital never draws weapons. They have three guys on the gate. The one's got an M60. The man an M60. They're all in civilian clothes. You know, M16s lock and loaded. So <clears throat> let's see the car. Let's see the car. Fire him. Fire him. You know, so you run through the gate. Go straight to the early room. <clears throat> right away, they gave Sean a weapon. But wouldn't give me one, because I was, you know, TDY in the middle laboratory. Hold on, McAfee, hold on. I said, come on, Sarge, give me a weapon, give me a weapon. I'll get on the line. I'll get on. Give me. Just hold on. Okay. So then he goes, you come back and say, well, um, go put on your big BDUs. Okay, I'm going to do that. Okay, man. Right, give me a weapon, give me a weapon. Because <laughs> so, my biggest fear was, Sitting in a, in, in a building and being blown up. Yeah. Now, I want to be outside. <laughs> so, uh, but that wasn't my duty. My duty was to evacuate the city. Oh, okay. But the evacuation wasn't called yet, so I want to be outside. <laughs> you know. So finally, Sergeant Major comes to him, Command Sergeant Major. He's fully dressed, fully equipped, got his mob gear, everything. Looks at me, McAfee, you're assigned to the lab? That's right, sorry, man, get your ass up there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, like, I mean, you're not going to bump us all, you made it, so I'll go straight up there. And, uh, we're all sitting around just waiting to get blown up, pretty much. Didn't know what had happened in the world, why this thing is going on. And all of a sudden, this captain comes through. Be all that you can be. I mean, she was wrecking our nerves with this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Because all the enlistments, you know, she's not going to get out there on the farm line. She's not going to help carry out any sick, you know. <laughs> so she's with pathology, you know. So she's, you know, she's going to grab equipment. And that's what she was doing. She started packing equipment. So uh, finally, that kind of now we got the word. They shut down the Korean jetliner. And uh, I mean, see, back then, Especially in Graf, we were 13 clicks from the Czech border, and they had tanks lined up on the border. We had tanks, they had tanks. When the alert went off, the tanks roared up. <laughs> you know, the guns come up. Everybody's locked and loaded. All it takes is one person to make one mistake, and we got to fight. Yeah, right. well, uh, one tank commander or somebody Just operating the gun. The, right, we got to fight. <laughs> uh, big one. In a, in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Tank rounds go a long ways. So everybody knew this, and uh, that just scared the crap out of me. I realized then what I really got myself into. It was it was real. But you you're only uh, uh, you're only been in what less than a year. Yeah, less than a year. Yeah, and you and you signed up for how many years? Uh, three. And <laughs> this is just the beginning of it. It's just the beginning. <laughs> just the beginning. So uh, um, did you enjoy uh, your other work? Uh, while you were there? Yeah, I, I enjoyed the lab work. Uh, we had another incident. Um, so, I mean, there was, matter of fact, the Army Times came and did a story on our unit, the 547th uh, General Dispensary. We did at the time, we did the most medevacs in the world. So they wanted to do a story. 15 May was our, uh, our um, uh, dust off. And uh, that unit was our dust off. Of course, they were doing the flights. We were calling in, uh, you know, uh, dust off, dust off. Kind of but it was just going on. We had uh, all kinds of injuries, deaths. Um, as a laboratory tech, that wasn't my responsibility. Just search the bodies, log down contents, you know, body bag. You know. That's what you were actually doing. Right. Process. At the time, I called the keeper of the dead. <laughs> Processing. Processing, yeah. That's the okay. Word. That uh, uh, nobody you knew. Right. Uh, soldiers. Just so. So, but uh, uh, buddies. I mean, it, it. soldiers are soldiers. Right. Well, I had a buddy got messed up, too. He, he dropped down the Autobahn. Um, he was in the backseat of a Mercedes Benz, and that thing split in half. And he got drugged about 200 yards down the Autobahn. He told us uh, it would take him six months before he could even rotate back home. Yeah. That's how I mess up. Before he even got healed up. Right. 
Did you go talk to him? No, never got a chance to. Got his name. Now I couldn't tell you his name, what his name was. Yeah, you remember him, though. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Still, yeah. Memory, memory's still there. The uh, Keeper of the Dead, how long, how long did that assignment last? As long as I was there. Oh, really? You finished out your entire career there? No. I uh, rotated out of uh, 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 Germany in uh, March of 84. Okay, well, Dylan, then you were there a couple of years. Almost a couple of years. Yeah, no, just shy. No, no, I got there in April. When I left April, Mother's Day, after Mother's Day, I went. I, I ended up in Germany. So that was, yeah, it, it was still April. Wasn't it Mother's Day in April or May? May. Yeah, it was in May. Father Day, Father Day's in June. Did um, uh, what was the weather like over there? Germany? Yeah, it's, it's not bad. You know, even dead of winter. You know, it's not that cold. Um, for some reason, I don't know. It was it wasn't that cold to me. I mean, you can get away with a uh, sweater under your uh, BDU blouse. You know, it wasn't that bad. Uh, Did uh, were you able to have? Uh, uh, free time on the weekends to, to go out and sightsee pictures? Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> when I finally, uh, because at the time I was a, I was a practicing Buddhist, you know, in chant, and I'm a Christian now, but, uh, um, there was a, I knew there was a uh, culture center, what they call it a culture center in uh, Frankfurt. So I would get on a train. Well, the first time I, uh, the first time, I went up there looking for it. I couldn't find it, but I knew that the international president of the organization was in town, in Frankfurt that day, and he was speaking. So I got on a train and went up there because I happened to be off. And I stopped at a Polizei station, a police station. And when I say police station, I'm talking about like a little booth. So there were three, four guys sitting around in a booth, you know, <laughs> open to the street, you know, and then talk, you know, and talk to them. So I said, I'm looking for a Buddhist meeting. A Buddhist meeting. Guru? Guru me? No, I'm not guru Buddhist, you know, you know, like a Buddhist monk, you know. He said, well, there's a guru meeting going on down here. So we went with this back and forth, but finally I decided I'm going to look at this guru meeting. Well, it turned out that's the place I wanted to be. It was a very fancy hotel. Opened up the door, disrupted the entire meeting. It was like a convention, you know. Wow, President, he's speaking. Wow, President Kayla, you know, everybody turn around and or should be right back out the door. <laughs> and I couldn't speak fluent German, so it was really no point to listen to it. But I sat there and waited, and I met some people that uh, belonged to the community center in, in uh, 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 Frankfurt there. And uh, they took me by the hand, and since I was off for the weekend, they took me up to uh, Cologne, went to Bonn, Dusseldorf, went ate dinner. And then every time I got off, I went with these people, you know. So they go to something totally different than what I was used to. Did um, you bring pictures back home? Yeah, I did, uh, but not pictures of, of, of that place. I didn't at that time, you know, no cell phone or anything like that. You know. Yeah. So oh no, it was all Kodak. And take, right, camera, thirty-five millimeter. So I wasn't getting bothered with that. You know, oh, okay. That stuff to deal with, you know. <laughs> so. oh, okay. Um, so um, as your um, your medical lab specialist, your duties uh, ended there. Um, where were you sent? Where were you shipped to? What was your next? Big Red One. Big Red One, congratulations. That's 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 cool. Yeah. Where at? United States Army Correctional Activity. I'm sorry? United States Army Correctional Activity, retraining brigade. Where at? Fort Riley, Kansas. Fort Riley, okay. Yeah, yeah that, for a civilian, so, yeah, that's it's a, just, you know, it's ETS out of that place, you know, and that was it. There's nothing really fancy going on, exciting going on there, you know. You know, and they uh, kind of stayed away from them guys anyway. So, <laughs> you know. They're just crazy. Yeah, they, well, you know, Big Red One. I mean, these guys are serious business. You know, you don't want to. You, you know, you don't want. If you learn soldiers, you know what soldiers you might want to drink with. The soldiers you don't want. You don't want to drink with because if things get out of hand, you, you're not going to win. <laughs> <laughs> now, did um, uh, anybody come back stateside? Anybody that was there with at Germany with you? Did any of the um, those that stayed in longer than I did? But by then, I was. I was out to be, um, Sean, matter of fact, he still, he, he came home, he told me they rotated the whole unit back. And the major became a colonel and all of that. And he ETS does a, uh, he got, he made E5, but then he went back to Germany, Mannheim, and run the PX, you know. 
Wow. Okay. I'm PA, so he's still over there. So, uh, do you keep in contact with him? Yeah, I do. I find him on Facebook, and uh, we talked. And as a matter of fact, it was this year he's supposed to come back home, but I don't the economy went sour, you know, <laughs> so I don't think he's going to be coming back anytime soon. Uh, Facebook, social networking has found a lot of people. Uh, have you found anybody else, any other uh, friends that you ran across that you served with? No. Uh, well, yes, and then I didn't want to talk uh, when I did find him. One was a guy by the name of Billups. He was with 15 men and did the dust off. He, he was a um, 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 flight medic. And the other one was a uh, uh, young lady by the name of Fitzpatrick. And she got married and had a kid. I found out in Florida she stayed out. One thing, uh, um, I just didn't want to talk. She was the only one to help me with the deal. Oh. Yeah, we get the deal coming in, everybody goes, they just run away. And Fitz was like, I have. It, t- it takes a certain type of individual to. Uh, handle a, a dead body. I'm yeah, well, we, we kind of turn into a game. You know? Got to do something, Mr. Yeah, make it make fun or whatever. Just keep your man off of it. You know? Yeah, because it's it's not it's not just a piece of meat that is a you know a human being. Somebody that was just like you. You know, uh-huh. it was some it was somebody who was just like you. You know, yeah, so oh, yeah. You, you quickly realize it could be you laying up here on this table. You know? Yeah, and. um a game is a good way to cope. It didn't bother you at that night or did any dreams? You know, I, when I was there serving, I was fine. I didn't start really having problems until after 9-11. When 9-11 took place, I just started really realizing just how easy it's going to be for anybody to get blown up one day. You know, triggered something. Yeah, it's just... You know. Yeah, the, the vul- vulnerability of the United States, the whole the whole free thing. Uh, you give up things when you have freedom. And that, you know what, that's what actually brought me to the Legion now. Because I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. And I didn't want to be around the public. When I came across the American Legion, I'm like, what is that? It's, uh, it's this organization for veterans. I said, veterans, I'm a vet. <laughs> I walked through the door. And it was at the time, it wasn't open to the, just wide open to the public, you know, party, party, party. But, uh, um, I walked in, it was a couple of old guys sitting on the bar and stuff. Told him who I was, what I did, and, you know. Oh, you should join. You know, I'm like, yeah, why not? I found a place I can come, call home, sit down, have a drink, and don't have to worry about anybody. Sure, why not? You know. But it took about, I don't know, seven years before I realized what it meant to be a legionnaire. You know, yeah. one day after, good. right after the, the meeting, well, at the beginning of the meeting, reading the preamble, I actually really started to take the notice of the preamble, and I'm like, oh wow. Oh, wow, you know, we got power, authority, you know, and a responsibility. And I'm like, sure, you know, let's get into this. And by this time, and build up the party scene and making money, and now they don't want to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> now, when uh, um, uh, you came back home, Big Red won, uh, what rank were you? Oh, he won. He won. It, was bad. It, was, it was a bad deal. Uh-oh, yeah. okay, whoops, sore spot, sorry. Uh, now, um, after you came back, uh, how long did you serve here until uh, you um, uh, with the big red one? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I ETS from that place in August, August fifteenth, eighty five. Eighty five. So you, that is that. That's where you came out of the military from. Yeah. Okay. Um, how'd that day feel? Great. Did it? Yeah. Couldn't. Be. <laughs> did, they, did they give you orders early? I mean, did you know the exact date? Did no, you, I didn't know the exact date. Um, they they knew that it would be sometime in August. They told me I wouldn't be able to get to that. So, okay, fine. <laughs> sometime in August. Sometime in August is what they told me. Well, it's still hot in Kansas in August. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. Not as hot as Texas, but it's still... It still gets pretty hot. It's, yeah. it's, it's still hot. Um, so, they, they came around. How, uh, how much advance warning did you have uh, before your final day? And that week was a long week, wasn't it? Yeah, I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> <laughs> you you were done, and your time was over. And, and now, did they uh, uh, buy you a bus ticket to get back home? Yeah, actually, they flew me back home. Okay. And so you went back to uh, your mom's house. That's correct. Okay. And that's a whole other story there because uh, 
I came home, I told my mom, uh, if you want to, if I'm asleep and you want to wake me up, don't touch me. Just keep knocking on the door or calling my name, you know, but don't touch me. And uh, she forgot to tell my younger sister. And she touched me and I grabbed her by the throat, had her up against the wall. And that same day I had to move out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but that was still, uh, you were just freshly back and that was all still on your mind and, uh, it was a, it was a different world. Um, uh, how was it, um, they, they flew you back. Did you fly back in your uniform? No. That's a day uniform. You could probably still have the military look. I mean. Oh yeah, haircut, all mannerisms, yeah, everything. Right. Nobody gave you any grief? No. Got back home, caught a, caught a ride to the house and hey mom, I'm home. And my brother picked me up from the airport. And, uh, yeah, took me back to my mom's house. Wasn't long before I was living with him for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, uh, now you said you'd, uh, you'd left school and found an opportunity with the military. So the military also has the, the GI Bill. Uh, did you partake in? Yeah, I did. And, man. um, when I actually looked at how much money I had gross, I was, uh, I was uh, I was angry. I was angry. Illinois Institute cost uh, what was it, sixteen thousand dollars a semester, and here I'm in gross something like uh, three thousand dollars. After all that time, I'm like, just give me my money back, you know, <laughs> just give me my money back, because right. I'm not right. I'm not. I'm not looking to. You can't do an engineering, a, a, a decent engineering program in community college at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going on now. But, uh, yeah, then it was, to me, it was like, okay, it's, it's a bust. It's a bust now. And the thing is, I went straight over to um, Cook County Hospital to get a job, you know, drawing blood or, you know, laboratory. And I, I worked all areas of laboratory except blood banking, you know. Uh, Oh, well, no, you can't have a job. You need to go back to school and get certified. I said, what are you talking about? I've been treating babies in general. You know, I mean, you know, what's the problem? Well, you got to be certified. I'm like, I've been, I've been serving my country and I've been serving people overseas. I mean, you know. Give me, the, te give me the test. Right. You know, give me, no, you got to have certification. Well, see, nowadays it's totally different. No. Oh, yeah, you can just knock on the door and get a job. Really? In the medical field, you've been doing it in the service. You can do it in the. Oh well, okay. These guys don't have to go get. They are the, the academy was my certification. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, actually, I went through uh, Cook County on, 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 a, on a, uh, a sick call and uh, ran across guys in the ER and uh, these two guys in there working. That's his. Uh, you guys been to the academy, right? Of health science for San Houston. Guy looked at me. He said, "How do you know that?" I says, hey, once a bet, always a bet. You know what the best. And uh, the nurses and the doctor wanted to know how I knew that. And then I uh, finally ended up telling her, I says, look, it's ethics. These boys got ethics. They know how to work. They know how to be clean. They know how to be quick about it. Uh, that ain't something you just can read about. It's something you got to practice. Mm -hmm. you know? Regimentation. Right. And that was the end of that story. It was like, hey, you wanted to hear it. I didn't want to tell you. Now you got it, you know? So. You got to suck at your own job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, um, well, you were in Germany. I mean, this is a big American base. Uh, any USO tours come through? No. Okay. No. Okay. You go to the local nightclub, see any of the entertainment that's... Uh... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they had one nightclub right outside the post. And um, <clears throat> one day, this is... Uh, this is uh, Halloween, and uh, my roommate, he's back on the post, and caught up with a guy at the dispensary from the, he was in the medic field, but I was in, you know, I was a laboratory technician, we were at the academy together at the same time. So they had came from Kaiser Slaughter, K-Town, they had drove a cracker box, you know, ambulance truck, yeah. down to, uh, down the graphing field, okay, they were on train, and, uh, he said, come on, Mac, if you're going, come on, go out with us. I said, look, I'm on, I'm, you know, I'm on duty. I got this pager that talks to me. I'm not going anywhere. It's, it's, it's the warrant officer, he's on duty, Boker, and you don't play with this guy. He'll write you up in a minute. So, uh, 
they kept bugging and bugging me. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll go out. I have, I have a drink. I have a drink with you guys. I'm just turning ready to go. So took him out. We went right outside the gate. It's like about 30, 40 feet outside the gate of this club. So we go in this club. And they got a stripper going on in this club. And this this girl, she's playing with the metal balls, you know, and drops it in the guy's glass, and he drinks his beer, and I'm like, oh, that's nasty. Oh, <laughs> but, my God. Yeah, oh, yeah. But by this time, these guys that bugged me to, to go out with her, my roommate went with us. They had took off and went somewhere else on the street. And we're still in the club, because I told them, man, man, forget those guys. <laughs> uh, so we're sitting there, and I go to the bathroom. And I come back and they got my partner up against the wall. Guys, other soldiers got him up against the wall. I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? So he grabbed that woman by the head. So what? She's a fucking stripper. (laughs) Racial thing. No. Okay. Terrible. So I'm looking around. I'm like, sir, I know you. You're a lieutenant. If you don't stop this shit, I'm going to report you. So then my friend goes, I know you. I did physical with you. I know you. I know your wife. (laughs) <laughs> like this. So they let him go. Everything goes back to normal. So we go back to our table. We sit down. All of a sudden, guy comes running through the door. You guys are medics, right? Like, yeah, what's up? Oh, my friend cut his finger off. What? <laughs> uh, where's he at? Uh, he's, he's in the bathroom now, you know. So we get out, we run the bathroom. I mean, this blood, big old trail blood. Because he's squirting the blood. His words just squirting on his hand. All into the bathroom. So we get in there. Uh, um, part says, grab him home now. So we put a presser bandage on him. So we press a bandage him. And uh, we just haul him back to the dispensary. You know, which is about a half a block away. We consider the distance, even though we were right outside the gate. Mm-hmm. And one rule, we had, to, we had to break this car in the road, which was, you can't walk past the Jones house, which is right by the front gate. Well, screw the Jones, this guy's right. <laughs> so, it's bleeding. Yeah, it's bleeding, right. So we do all that. We didn't. We got away with that one. <laughs> um, again, the dispensary, and they go to work on them, and uh, so then uh, Volker comes to me, and he says, uh, Reggie, can you find out why that guy cut his finger off? Can you ask him? I says, okay, I'll go ask him, <laughs> you know. So I go in there, and we're talking to him, and he's like, uh, so finally he tells me, I don't want to be here, this and this and this. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to be here either. I mean, so now we've both been in the room crying, you know. <laughs> Volker comes by the room. McAfee, you relieved the duty. Thank you, sir. You got the hell up out of it. <laughs> so, but that began, that wasn't that I really began to drink. Because um, I would only just get beer. Now I want, now I want something strong. I started drinking Hennessy that night. Um, liquor. Yeah. That so cognac going. I want liquor. Yeah, I'm like, okay, this is getting to be a whole lot. <laughs> you know, a little bit too much now. It's, you know. Um, so, yeah, that, that went like that. There was, there was like, always something going on. Like I said, Army Times came in the story on us, and it was interesting. I mean, you talk about racism. Yeah, racism was going on. They knew Army Times was coming out and do a story. So what did they do with as many black people as they could in the unit? They sent us somewhere else. They sent me to Bill Sick, the run sick call, and brought the girls back, you know, this kind of thing. Well, guess what Army Times did? They knew who, they knew who was doing the business. They came right on over there to Bill Sick, took my picture, interviewed me, and that was that. And then when the... <laughs> It was so funny because when when the, when the picture came, well, I mean, when the paper came out, you saw uh, Spec Five, uh, John Starks. He pretty much run that ran the helo pad. He's a man. He showed uh, showed him walking out uh, with someone on the guard. He was going to get uh, headed back to the hospital. Had my picture in the paper. It was just all black people, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> The other people who thought they was going to have his place was look Lily White was pretty upset because none of them made the made the paper. <laughs> oh my God, and that, that, that's so poor to hear. I mean, I hate that. I'm glad that you can uh, laugh about it. I probably wasn't laughable at the time, but no, because there was a little backlash between that. You know, what I'm saying extra duty and stuff like that to be done. You know? Yeah, and that's but that's, we didn't set it up. You know, we were just but that's and, and and but to us that was some comfort because. Um, it just let us know that the military knew who was doing the work. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And that, that's good. I mean, and that's what it was about. Yeah. Some of the, some of the higher up. Right. Billups. They had Billups' picture in the paper. He was um, the flight medic I was talking about. He, he was blowing up somebody with a broken leg. They had a, like a blow-up cast, you know, to help him uh, stabilize. Mm-hmm. Bones. 
Cool. Did um, uh, did you get very much leave? You're granted leave. I mean, were the uh, three day passes or anything like that? I mean, well, uh, yeah, it was just I never really got a leave. I just you know I would have like two days off or something you know, on the weekend, you know, pretty okay. much a weekend. You know. Okay, so there there was never like thirty days that you were able to. No, the the, the I did get a thirty day uh, vacation. I'm trying to. Uh, I took that thirty days right after um, AIT. Right. I spent a lot of it in Texas. A friend of mine had it. <laughs> he says, Reggie, I got to I gotta go to my next duty station, but the you know, apartment is paid for, you know, for next month, you know. So I stayed there for like uh what, two weeks. Then this girl that I met in um Houston called me, I went, Why don't you come spend some time with me? So I went down there, really I drove down there, spent some time with her. And then I'm like, I woke up one day, I'm like What's the, what's tomorrow? She said, tomorrow's Mother's Day. Oh, shit. I got to go. I mean, I, we, oh, we were waking up, you know, from having a nice night and everything. I got to go. <laughs> I got to go see my mom because I, you know, I'm going to be going to Germany in a few days, you know. Oh, my God. Right. So I had to get up and drive. <laughs> that's a, that's a quick trip. Yeah. Uh, she was, she wasn't happy about it, but my mom was late. It made it just in time for Mother's Day dinner. Good man. Right. Did you, um, did you ever write? Anything now? I mean, keep a, a ledger, a, a diary? Or... No, I just wrote uh, letters. And um, most of those letters went to uh, William Snyder, the, the attorney. You know, I wrote my mom a couple of times. You know, I got called in the office a couple of times uh, in Germany. Uh, write your mom. Okay. Call oh. your mom. Oh, okay. they, tell, they tell you to. Yeah. When, yeah, because they call in the Red Cross. They bug at everybody else. Oh, okay. how's my son with you? How are you? Uh, stuff like that. So, oh, okay. Oh, I did. I did realize. Oh, but for me, I I just didn't want to call home because what I, I what I was doing was real serious, and I didn't want because my mom she's like she knows how to get into your head, so <laughs> I didn't want her doing that. And, you know, I just wanted to focus in on what I was doing, make sure I didn't keep doing that right. You got got back home. Um, and got back home and, and unceremoniously uh, got asked to leave. Got asked to leave. There shortly. Too violent. <laughs> Too violent. Did it, um, did it take very long to slow down? I mean, were you having dreams? I mean, you said that they didn't start until later, but. Uh, um, no, I think I was just mostly, I didn't really know I had knew I had a problem. But my brother, when he picked me up from the airport, he looked at me and said, dude, you got issues. I'm like, you're okay, right? Uh, you know, I never even thought that what he was saying was really true. Uh, but he could just, he just saw that in me. And, uh, Family has a way of doing that. And tell you honestly, too. Right. right. And, yeah, and, and for you to say that now, um, that, that meant something to you, you remembered it. Right. So, when, you know, I'm a lot better than what I used to be. Because I wouldn't even, you would ask me about the military, I was like, yeah, it's there, man. And then just walk away, you know. Um, cause I didn't want to talk about it. If I talk about it, I just cry profusely, you know. So I'm not better than what I used to be. Well, I hope, I hope this interview doesn't stir anything up. I hope that you don't, you know, reoccurring dreams or anything like that. I, I really honestly hope that, that it doesn't, it doesn't do that. I know that, uh, uh in some it has. It, right. Well, I didn't, I don't, I don't mind talking the story that I thought that it'd be a good idea to do that. You've got, <laughs> this is incredible. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. Um, so, um, did I, I did, if I touched on the job you got, uh, you went and did you go back to school? Yeah, I, uh, when I got back home, I went back to, uh, to, uh, could get into the Illinois Institute of Technology, I owed them a thousand dollars. And, uh, well, the dean kicked me out of school. Let me tell you how that went. Um, I had a bad semester. I got some, got too many D's. And, uh, Never flunked a, a class in my life until I got to the Learning Institute of Technology. I flunked a two hour uh, technical drawing class. And that little class cost me $750. So I'm like, hey, hey, you know, this can't be happening. So it was, you know, but then, um, that was the same semester where, you know, that, and so the, the dean put me on probation, which was fine. I deserved it, you know, because this ain't going to happen again. I guarantee this. And so, uh, as a result, uh, I did a lot of work with the metallurgical engineering department and the, and the chairman of the department. He had me working in the laboratory with the grad students. Now, I'm supposed to clean it up in the system and all this stuff like that. Believe it or not, I was learning more than some of the grad students. 
I would actually sit in the classes and the classes and things like that. And um, one day we went to lunch. Um, there were three grad students that ran the help run the department. One was a PhD candidate, the other were two master candidates. And we went to lunch, and there was a white Sox game going on that day. And we went on 31st Street and crossed over the highway, the Dan Ryan Highway. And we came back on the way coming back, crossing back over, because right at the go on the other side, there's Old Race Institute of Technology, but there's a train track, a viaduct, if you will, that you have to go under. But right after that, that's all off the Old Institute of Technology property from 30, 31st Street all the way to 35th. And when we were trying to cross the street to go over to get under the divider, and this guy coming out the game, stone drunk, just hit his broadside with this huge car. Now we in a little two-door glory, oh. and he was driving some really huge car. So I'm sitting in the back seat with this master candidate, the PhD candidate's driver, and other master candidate sitting up front. And his name was Rudy in the back with me. And I'm talking to Rudy. And Rudy's eyes is getting big as saucers, and I'm like, like he's looking at, he's looking past me, and I'm like, so I turn around and look, and I see this car. I mean, the hood of the car is right here. Oh my! So I scream, ah, bam! When I came to, I was in Rudy's lap. Rudy was still knocked out. I must have, my head, I had concussion. I was messed up. My head broke his his front jaw and teeth was just all jacked up. He was knocked out. The the other master candidate was laid out on the ground in the middle of the intersection. He came out and fell out. And the PhD candidate is walking underneath the Vodok. He's just he's in all land. He doesn't even know where the hell he is. And so we all get together, Airmen's come and stuff like that. They took they did take Rudy. And uh so uh we go back to the to the uh to the school and uh, I went straight to the dorm and we went straight to bed. But then I realized when I woke up, I was messed up. So I had to go and see, uh, saw a doctor over at the hospital, did a CAT scan, and uh, yes, yeah, you have a concussion, you yeah, know, serious concussion. I said, okay. But now I can't focus. I can't focus my eyes. I can't concentrate. And I'm crying all the time. <laughs> and uh, it's finals. And I flunked there recently. Oh, my. And so the dean gets in touch with me. I told you, you was on probation. Now you're out of here. You're done. I said, but Dr. Soletta is not my father. I was in the car. I said, I don't give a shit. I'm like, okay, fine. So I was like, screw him. You know, summer came. I took took the courses over in the summer, all except chemistry class. Got B's and C's. GPA came up to a 199. And, I, and in the fall, I didn't take any classes that I was supposed to take on schedule. I just took the chemistry class. And um, he calls me up at home. Didn't I kick you out of school? Yes, you did, Dr. Slitter, but I took those courses over the summer. And GPA's 199. As soon as I finish this chemistry class, I'll be well over 2.0. I don't give a shit. You show back up on this campus, I'm going to have you arrested. And that's when I knew I didn't want to join the Army. Because <laughs> that's not going anywhere. Oh, my God. So uh, There was uh, uh, another ulterior motive that uh, uh, prompted you to that. Right. Well, you know, somebody told me a story going up and go from rags to riches. You know, I'm trying to get to the rich part. <laughs> you know? so, you know, I'm not giving up. I still don't give up. I did a water basic safety class at Fort Riley, Kansas. And that was, that was, that was, that's how I finished. Never give up. I was the last one out the water. Never give up. Never give up. Cause I'm not going to drown. I'm not going to let you drown. You know, if I end up in the water, I got to learn how to do this. So. It was, it was nice that, um, uh, after your service, that you, I mean, nobody asked you to join the Legion after, but you walked in. Correct. You walked in, you walked into the post and said, hey, you know, what's it all about? Um, and I noticed that uh, it says past, uh, Sergeant at Arms. Yeah. Uh, so you have served as an officer. Right. Uh, at your post. So, uh, how, how many years have you been a member? I came in, it, you know, they had, when I first joined, they got my name wrong, uh, Rev Ward McAfee. And, uh, you know, I'll show you. Um, I was showing my new first division commander. It took him about three, four years to get the name right. <laughs> R E V E W A R D F McAfee. Right. I said, you know anybody name, named right? Red Ward? Do you know anybody named Red Ward? <laughs> you know, it's just kind of weird, you know. 
So <laughs> Hon- honorable, honorable service. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so they finally got that straight. But what they didn't tell me is that, because um, I joined in 2001, but what they didn't tell me was that uh, if you you have to pay your membership every year. This I knew, but if you miss a year, you start off. All over again. All over again. I said, oh, man, you know, because my, my car could actually read 11 years, you know, but because I only missed two. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, but you've been active. You've been active at your post. So yeah, this is, yeah. That's good. I mean, and you're here at the, here at the state convention. So. First time. Oh, first time? Oh. First time. What do you think of it? Oh, I'm, I'm, re- I'm really loving it. I I'm, I'm, can't wait to go back and tell some other guys that, hey, you know, this is something you really want to be a part of. You know, you get to, uh, you know, make resolutions and decide on issues that end up being kicked up to the, uh, you know, national level in which they decide. But the, how the, how we do it is that they break it down so you get into a small group. You can be the chairman of the group, you know, or the secretary. So you'll have some definite input, some definite say, you know. And still, like that, still, uh, with, still with the military regimentation. Yeah. They, they still got all that, how you run the meetings and, and rising and, and sitting and all done on command. So it's it's, it's still familiar uh, to the veterans. I, you know, a lot of us, I guess, we do, we love the Legion because um, we're just going to die soldiers. Oh, so, yeah, you're soldier all your life. Right. <laughs> Is there, a, Reginald, I've got to say that I'm just, I'm, you've had quite the, quite the career, quite a lot. What a military life! I'm 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 proud of you. I thank you so much for your service. Thank uh, you. You, <laughs> it's it's been amazing listening to you. I mean, uh, uh, is there uh, uh, anything else? I mean, a, another story? None that, you, that I would want to put on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, you know, participating in this interview is is you know, this goes to the Illinois Library. This goes to uh, the Congressional. Uh, library in Washington, and you'll get a you'll get a copy. Kent will be uh, uh, giving you a processing and giving you a copy. Um, this is history, just like it says, uh, Veterans History Project, and that's something that you're a part of. Is you're part of the history of the military, and I'm uh, I just can't say how proud I am to to have interviewed you to to you know shake your hand. Uh, you're you're a man's man and a good military man, and I I thank you so much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Reginald has been Thank great. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell you what, get a box of tissues in here for your next one.